Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Life is filled with loopholes and technicalities. Like it or not, that's probably why when a bill is passed in Congress, or in the State House, or, well, thankfully not at least in our voter meetings, but bills tend to be very long, very wordy, very detailed. Because when the law is given, man looks for the loophole. How can I get around this? How can I find a way to be excused from what this is telling me to do? And even though we don't like it when the other guy gets the advantage, when he finds that escape clause that we didn't know about, the truth is we, we like loopholes too. We like loopholes very much when we know about them when they excuse us from what we need to do, what we must do, what we should do. For without these escape clauses, we might end up well, looking pretty bad. And there were plenty of escape clauses to be found. But that is our human nature, our fallen human nature, to catch the other guy, but hope that no one comes looking for us. We are indeed hypocrites. And what is it that our Lord says? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother. Now we like our loopholes. We like those comfortable lies that say, you don't actually deserve Wrath, death, condemnation. We like to sit back and say, see, I'm not so bad. And actually, if you look at it the right way, well, I'm pretty good. But in the Gospel lesson today, Jesus continues his teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking to us about true, faithful discipleship. And the commands that Jesus are giving this morning are just that. Commands. Plain, simple teachings for disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are true, sobering, soul-jarring, unsettling commands. He's giving the law. What Christ gives us is actually even more than law. You have heard it said about murder, adultery, divorce, taking oaths. What I say to you. What Jesus says regarding these four things is no joke. He actually takes the law to a new level. A level that is so unattainable, so unachievable, that we are left crushed defeated for no man can live up to this standard no one could hope to do so but you know what in truth Christ isn't actually taking these laws to any new level he isn't adding or amending any of the law the laws that fall neatly within the Ten Commandments what Christ actually is doing is closing up the loopholes that man has wrongly introduced into the Word of God. For here, the Word of God Himself, the Word made flesh, is telling us exactly what He means and saying exactly what He means in the law. No technicalities, no loopholes, no gray areas. See, sinful man always looks for that loophole to any law or rule. And that's exactly what Christ is getting at when he addresses the disciples. God gave his word to his people years before. And faithful preachers and teachers like Moses 
And like Aaron, they did their jobs telling the people exactly what God meant. But as is always the case with sinful man, time passed. And the purity of God's word was slowly, methodically, steadily replaced with man's own interpretation, man's own feeling. Man's own man-made justification. Sinful man looked at the straight and narrow path that is God's word and God's will, and he started weaving, weaving little loopholes, technicalities, the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law, looking for ways not only to excuse his own sin, but ways to get in good with God and to keep his law, at least technically. See, God didn't give us the rope. We sought that out ourselves. But the old adage is true that give a man enough rope and he'll hang himself. Because the same old excuses ring out, and sadly they probably ring in our ears as well. I've never physically murdered anyone. I've never made off with someone else's spouse. Sure, I've, I've been divorced a time or two, but I followed the rules and I did it the right way. It was all legal and above board. See, I have the certificate to prove. Now, as for oaths, I've never falsely sworn to anything, and I've never sworn to anything that I personally couldn't make happen. Yes, sir, I have kept the law. I've kept it well, and that's got to count for something. Now, of course, we know the answer to that question, right? It doesn't count for anything, not in terms of salvation, because Christ isn't just talking here about four specific problems. It's not as if there were only these these four cases There were a problem, and everywhere else, everyone was keeping the law just right. No, these were four examples, four easy examples that Christ used and still uses to call us out, to break our deluded self-confidence, to call us to repentance and forgiveness and life. So ask yourself, have you ever gossiped about anyone? Have you ever blown off church? Premarital sex, that's just, that's just the way of the world now, right? Have you ever turned your eye to it? Been silent when you should have spoken? Maybe each of us might fess up to one or two transgressions. We've got our reasons, our justifications for those other things we do. Maybe I was talking about my neighbor, but it wasn't really gossip, at least not the way that that the dictionary would define it. And premarital sex, that's, that's between them. Who am I to judge? Adultery sure is bad, but... But that's not really all sex outside of marriage, right? And it's a problem when so-and-so misses church. That's, uh, but when I go, when I, when, when I skip, it's not, it's not a big deal. I mean, I, you don't have to go every week, right? I, percentage-wise, I do a pretty good job of showing up. I do a pretty good job of honoring the Sabbath. So what if I miss once in a while. And what is it that God says? Notice I didn't ask you what you think God says or what you'd like God to say. What is it that God says? He's very clear. He's in charge. This is sin. You have broken my commandment. Notice also that when Jesus is bringing the law to its fullness, 
closing these loopholes. He doesn't ask how you feel about these clarifications. He doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, my, my commandment hurts your feelings. Well, I don't want that. I tell you what, this commandment is for everyone else except you. I don't want you to feel like a real sinner. Except that's exactly what Jesus wants you to feel with the law. That you are a sinner. To wake up and realize that you have sinned, that you are in need of a Savior. That you need forgiveness. That you need life and salvation. You, me, and everyone else born of man are sinners by nature. And the only thing we actually deserve is hell, death, and damnation. But here's the thing about Jesus' clarification of the law. It really is unattainable and unachievable. We cannot keep it perfectly. We cannot keep it the way that God intends. Only Christ can do that. And Christ has done that. We always fail. But He never stumbles. So why then, is, why then is Christ doing this? Clarifying the law in such a way? Doesn't he know it's unrealistic, unreasonable? Does he know what he's doing? Well, yes, he knows exactly what he is doing. And he isn't doing it to be mean. He's doing it because he loves us. And he knows that when saving faith meets the law, this harsh, brutal reality it does only one thing it repents it doesn't argue it doesn't excuse it doesn't hire a lawyer and try to find a loophole it just says to God you're right I'm wrong forgive me not because of what I've done not because of the good things that I'm doing but because of your son my Savior forgive me for Christ's sake. And that's really what this part of the Sermon on the Mount is about. It's about repentance. It's about a right relationship. Not in that deluded, false kind of peace, the go-along, to get-along way that the world would have you do. This is about the very real faithful way that God views relationship. Relationships between Him and His people, between Him and you, and between you and all those around you. The real relationship of the Christian is a relationship between God and a relationship between neighbor. And when our relationships with each other are broken, damaged by sin and division, we show that our relationship with God is also broken. Because reconciliation, reconciliation is the sign that disciples belong to Jesus. And the refusal to be reconciled is a sign that the person no longer belongs to Jesus. For when our relationship is right with Christ, in that truly humble, penitent relationship that looks not at our works, but to Christ alone, for forgiveness, life, and salvation, then our relationships with others will follow naturally as the fruit of the Spirit. We will be gracious and loving because of the grace and love that God has shown us. And our faith will bear fruit, the pure, faithful fruit of repentance that fears, loves, and trusts in God above all things. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.